The little girl I'm babysitting just broke me emotionally. Her family doesn't care about her condition, so I'm venting about it online instead. So, Mr. Jacobs, you have experience working with difficult children? Ms. Wilson asked, her voice harsh and grating. She gestured for me to have a seat behind a long oak table with three antique desk lamps spread across the top, all switched on, despite it not being dark outside yet. Call me Mark, I replied, dropping my leather satchel onto the floor. And that's right, although the preferred term is elaborate. I paused, cleared my throat. Well, I was classroom assistant at a special education school for five years. And were you a stern disciplinarian? She circled the table and stared out a bay window. On the far side of some vertical iron bars, heavy raindrops pummeled the glass. Well, actually, we've been having trouble retaining help, Mr. Jacobs. Childminders are in rare supply these days. She could say that again demand had swelled these past months, to the point romance-starved parents had begun paying double the standard rate for sitters. Still with her back to me, my prospective employer said, children require a strong authority figure, especially one as spirited, as Sienna. You're not soft, are you? No. In fact. If you're not up to the task, perhaps I should recruit a candidate with a touch more, grit? Was this some rattle the interviewee to see how they cope under pressure technique? Well, I wasn't letting a wrinkled coat of skin and bones stand between me and a juicy payday. I pushed myself to standing. Ms. Wilson, there's nothing Sienna can throw my way I haven't seen a million times before. Trust me. You'd be surprised. I leaned forward, hands on the table. Ms. Wilson, what exactly is the nature of your granddaughter's conduct? This way, she said, in a sharp tone that closed the book on that particular line of inquiry. I followed her through a musty corridor lined with doors, past the occasional ceramic lamp. The bottom of the beige wallpaper appeared faded shiny in places, as though an army of snails had been racing back and forth. Funny, you'd think the owner of such a luxurious mansion would put more effort into maintaining it, but this place hadn't seen a lick of paint since my grandparents needed sitters. As we walked, a ceiling bulb twitched. We've been having trouble with the electrics, Miss Wilson said over her shoulder. If this storm gets any worse, they're liable to go out. At the foot of a sprawling staircase by the front entrance, she stopped and faced me. Should that happen, there's a generator in the basement, although it requires a manual start. She gestured toward a duffel bag draped over the fancy banister. The instructions are in there, along with a flashlight. The entrance is beneath the staircase. While she pulled on a raincoat, my eyes wandered about. A huge oil painting was mounted on the wall to our right whalers harpooning a giant squid attempting to capsize their vessel. Ms. Wilson grabbed an umbrella from a stand beside the huge, double doors. Sienna's in her playroom, take her right at the top of the stairs, third door on your left. Keep her engaged and out of mischief until I return, understood? But. Understood? A shriveled digit stabbed the air for emphasis. Understood. She studied me a moment, as though contemplating whether she'd made a grave mistake. Remember Mr. Jacobs above all else, children require discipline. With that, the door slammed shut behind her. It struck me as odd my employer disappeared without first introducing the child left in my care. Or leaving a contact number. Or indicating how long she'd be gone. But hey, the money. With every step, the staircase creaked in its various joints. I turned right at a large, arched window and walked along a carpeted hallway, passing candlestick lamps spaced out every six feet or so, then knocked on a door labeled playroom. No response. I tried again, harder. Still nothing. Maybe Sienna was deaf? I shivered the door open. Beyond it, toy animals and dolls lay scattered around a circular kid's table. Sienna? I called, stepping forward. I'm Mark, you're new. Rar, shouted a tiny voice. I yelped and spun toward a frail girl, doubled over with laughter, who'd hidden behind the doorway. You must be Sienna, I said chuckling. Yep. She was eight years old with long, dark hair tied up by a golden clip. She wore a pink blouse decorated with cartoon fish and had to be about the palest child I'd ever seen. Immediately my mind spun off to possible illnesses anemia, low blood sugar. I'm Mark, your new babysitter. Hi Mark. Well Sienna, 
I'm afraid we've got a serious problem your grandma left without telling me your favorite game. I fished Monopoly and Connect 4 out of my satchel. What do you like most? She shrugged. You don't have a favorite game? What about your friends? What do you play with them? As she stared at the floor, eyes narrow, it occurred to me friends must be hard to come by in the middle of nowheresville. I smiled and said, we'll just have to figure that out then. Huddled around the desk, the two of us played several spirited rounds of Jenga. My opponent's face tensed every time she nudged a block and, whenever my turn came around, she collapsed the tower by kicking a table leg, cackling each time. While we warmed up to one another, I led her away with the mischief. After losing a round on the very first block, the little brat folded her arms and said, Jenga's stupid. Now, now. Just because you lost. Different game, she demanded. There were several intense rounds of go fish, snakes, and ladders, and connect four. Each time Sienna won, she skipped around the room, but the instant she lost, boards got flipped, demands for a new game issued. Thirty minutes later, I deliberately lost at checkers so I could excuse myself to the bathroom. Ms. Wilson completely overhyped this gig. I'd worked with truants who set my shoelaces on fire, did she think Jekyll Hyde-esque temper tantrums would rattle me? While I washed my hands, outside gutters gurgled as rain streamed down, hard and fast. At the roar of lightning, the light blinked off, and during the five seconds of complete darkness that followed, there came a thwap from across the landing a boneless sack dropping onto the wooden floor. Oh crap, did Sienna suffer from seizures? Narcolepsy? Her skull might have just cracked open like an egg. The nearest hospital was a two-hour drive away. Not to mention the fact my phone lost signal six miles out from this grandiose estate. Before I could bolt back across the hall, light shades and lamps sprung back to life. I burst through the door only to discover Sienna standing patiently beside the table. A cursory scan of the space didn't reveal any overturned cabinets or fallen chests. Halfway across the room, my foot skidded in a clear puddle spreading itself across the wooden floorboards. My arms windmilled as I bit down on a swear. Now you could really hear the wind howl from behind closed curtains at the far side of the room, intersected with the occasional roar of lightning. I made a mental note of letting Ms. Wilson know the roof had sprung a leak. Did you fall? I asked Sienna, who shook her head. The lights. Oh, they do that sometimes. What are we playing next? By the time we burned through the rest of my collection it had gotten dark out, but Miss Wilson didn't mention a bedtime, only to keep the rascal engaged. Any idea where your grandma went? I asked after losing its nap. Still a bundle of energy, Sienna bounced up and down and answered, Nope, what next, what next? How about hide and seek? After making her swear she'd stay indoors, I said, All right, you go, I'll count to fifty. Soft footsteps padded off down the hall, a little cackle fading into the house. Here's a tip for any aspiring babysitters three-story mansions especially ones where the lights sputter off and on are easy places to lose children entrusted to your care there was no sign of Sienna in any of the ground floor washrooms, nor the library, nor the dining area. As I looped back toward the front entrance, thunder blared, close by. All around the house, bulbs and lamps blanked, shivered, and finally, died. Once it became clear there'd been no miraculous resurrection I felt my way toward the downstairs banister. Sienna, game's over, I yelled. Come out come out wherever you are. My hands located the duffel bag, fumbled through it. Inside there was a flashlight, which I flicked on, and an instruction booklet for a generator. Starting the device seemed simple enough turn the fuel valve, pull the choke control, flick the engine switch, and then pull on the recoil rope. Easy. From the far end of a claustrophobic hallway, metal pans drum rolled along the floor and then a door slammed hard enough to make glasses rattle. Had Sienna fallen? Guided by the torchlight, I hurried along the hall, one hand against the wall for support, calling out. In the kitchen, utensils lay scattered about here and there. Muffled sounds came through a heavy wooden door beyond the fridge. The door opened at a push. Beyond it lay a pantry larger than my apartment containing multiple rows of freestanding shelves crammed with food. Sienna? You in here? Through a narrow gap above a stack of soup tins, there was fleeting movement. Oh great, she thought the game hadn't ended. Sorry Sienna, fun's over. We have to. 
As I rounded the shelf words caught in my throat, any assumptions that might have been her quickly melting away. Directly ahead of me, long, dark appendages reached out and grasped objects from the very top shelf a height of nearly 8 feet. The silhouette of a nightmarish, hulking frame almost occupied the full width of the aisle. My column of light remained trained on the floor, because to look directly at it would be too terrible a thing. Half choking on my own heart, I quickly retreated into a shelf. For a long and breathless moment glass jars chattered away, then a container of pickles plummeted onto the floor and exploded beside my feet. The silhouette twisted. Then, this high-pitched shriek rang out, worse than rusty nails along a chalkboard. Only vaguely aware of my own actions, I burst from the pantry, across the kitchen, down the hall, desperately crashing against the occasional welted house plants and snoozing lamps. Halfway toward the front entrance, a voice in some small corner of my brain said wait, what about Sienna? The poor thing's still around here somewhere. Another ear-piercing shriek went up. To hell with her. Fingers crossed she picked a great hiding spot. By the front entrance, I slipped on the rug and fell, the flashlight rolling to a stop nearby. I clawed my way forward. Those double doors refused to budge, even after several shoulder charges. I pulled back the curtain covering the side window, revealing more iron bars. There was no way out. I'd become a cow in an abattoir. At the next shriek, my back pressed flat against the entranceway. The intruder didn't walk or crawl it slithered, slithered past the staircase, a puddle of glistening ooze trailing behind. Across the rug, a huge jaw opened into four segments like a budding flower, each compartment serrated with needle-like teeth dripping with saliva. A rancid, sulfuric breath blasted my nostrils, warmer than a sauna. All attempts at pleading for mercy came out as an articulate babble. This was the end. But then, beyond the arched window above the stairs, a series of lighting twigs stroked out of the clouds. In the brief moment that followed, I glimpsed a creature with sinusy gray-orange skin not unlike an octopus and a pear-shaped body, roughly my chest height. There were six tentacles four along the bottom, two in place of arms. Long, dark hair sprouted from the head, held together by a golden clip, and somehow the beast had been wrangled haphazardly into a blouse covered with cartoon fish, more out of place than an alligator in a wedding dress. As the darkness evaporated, the skin became alive with movement, shifting, writhing, losing both color and gloss as it deflated like a released balloon. Tentacles fused together while that endless cavern of a jaw sealed itself shut. A giggly sienna stepped forward and gave my hand a little shake. You found me. Okay count again. Turn and face the door while I... Just then, the lightning storm ended. Sienna's body swelled as if being puffed up, her legs separating into four tentacles which slumped onto the floor with slimy thwaps. Another coiled around my forearm, sickeningly wet. That crowded jaw popped open again, a deep chasm wide enough it threatened to envelop me whole, a foul sulfuric breath blasting me in both nostrils. Before I could react, a slanted shaft of moonlight stabbed into the hall through the window above the stairs, and the tentacle uncurled. The moon had just emerged from behind purple-black storm clouds. I go hide, okay? Sienna finished, her voice full of innocence. I toppled backward, onto the floor, and scrambled away, yelping as something jabbed me in the side the flashlight. Stay away from me, I whimpered at an advancing Sienna. Head tilted to one side, she said, huh? You're, you're a fucking monster. The youth said, no. We're not playing fucking monsters, we're playing hide and seek, remember? Beyond the window, the pale moon began slipping away once again. Sienna's body entered a state of metamorphosis adorable child one moment, hideous, shrieking abomination the next. She only became a monster in the dark. I fumbled for the flashlight, heart slamming against my ribcage, and pointed the beam forward a split second before Mr. Moon said goodnight. Hey, you're cheating, she snapped. You didn't even count. Cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. This wasn't happening, this couldn't be happening. Sienna was blissfully unaware of her. Condition. She insisted I count properly before attempting to scurry off, but by slipping into the dark she'd transform again. Desperate to appease her, I screamed, wait I've got a better game. She glanced over her shoulder. Really? I gulped. Yeah. It's sit still game. How do we play? You sit absolutely still and wait for your grandma to come back. What? 
I'm not playing that. Okay, okay, I said, gently. Then let's go back to your room and play Jenga. No. Please. I know I'll run, and you have to catch me. No. Please no. Too late, she took off across the landing. I tailed her into a lounge, where she rolled over sofas and scurried beneath tables on her hand and knees. Anytime she escaped the beam shrieks spread throughout the mansion and I furiously attempted to pin her down again, begging her to keep still all the while. Up the steps, down a maze of halls, over carpets and groany floorboards, bashing my shin against elegant antique French desks, terrified of getting too close while simultaneously maintaining a safe buffer zone. La 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 la, you're never gonna catch me, she shouted every now and again. We continued back and forth along these lines for ten minutes. Despite the cold air, I broke out in a heavy sweat, breathing rapidly. Just when I thought the situation couldn't get any worse, the flashlight sputtered. Ms. Wilson hadn't even left a fresh set of batteries, how much longer could these ones chug along for? I needed to start the generator, but in the dark, the beast would re-emerge. Maybe I could slip away unnoticed? I halted, letting the distance between Sienna and I grow widen, then, once she rounded the far end of the corridor, I blitzed back toward the stairs. Let her run amok up there while. Behind me, vases smashed and lampshades got set swinging. Within seconds slithers filled the claustrophobic corridor. I angled the light at my pursuer, who morphed moments before crashing into my chest. She stepped away, one hand on her hip, the other wagging a finger in the air. Hey, you're supposed to chase me. On unsteady legs I backstepped while she stomped her foot, fists clenched. You don't want to play with me, do you? I do, I said, still reversing. I'll play some more, I promise, but we need to get the lights working first. Will you be a good girl and stand really still while I fix them? My free hand rose in a submissive gesture, slowly. It was the way you move when confronted with a rabid animal. You're only saying that because you don't want to play anymore. You're just like all the others. That's not, others? I'm gonna tell my grandma you wouldn't play with me, she said, now furious. And with that, she charged in my direction. Is there any sight more pitiful than a grown man sobbing whilst fleeing from an eight-year-old girl? I begged her to leave me alone, repeatedly promising we'd play for hours if she'd only be a well-behaved child and let me get the generator working. If the flashlight blinked out just then Ms. Wilson would come home and discover Sienna spoiled her appetite by snacking on a portion of leftover babysitter. I couldn't shake her loose but also couldn't let her out of my sight. I needed some way of making her stand absolutely. Sienna, I've got a new game. Really? She asked, suspicious but intrigued. It's called statues? How do we play? Okay, whenever I'm looking at you, you have to stand absolutely still. Yeah? Every second the bulb lost more juice. I gave it a whack and waited until my playmate settled in human form before saying, and you can only move when I'm not looking. If I catch you, you have to take 10 no 20 steps back. Got it? Got it. Okay. Go to the very end of the corridor. I withdrew slowly, keeping the light fixed on her until another bend crept along. Then, I bolted for the stairs. The screeching monster slithered after me until I illuminated it at the very last second. Sienna froze, already transforming back. As tentacles shifted into legs and arms, she shivered forward a few inches. You moved, twenty steps. Although her hands shot up in a little protest, she reluctantly obliged. After sidestepping toward the top of the staircase, I made another desperate break for safety, and, as the steps flew beneath my feet, the creature burst from the landing. The twitching light made her human again mere seconds before that jaw. A canyon glistening with saliva, snapped shut around the back of my neck. You moved, I said after Sienna re-emerged. Did not. What the hell is that? I roared, and pointed past her shoulder. She looked around. Huh? Twenty steps. Dramatically, she stomped up the stairs. Six careful steps brought me to the banister. I dashed around it for the basement door as a tentacle draped over the side of the stairway ready to envelop my skull. The appendage shrunk into a frail hand clutching a post under the weak light. Above me, Sienna's skull poked out between bars, a miniature prisoner. 
From the pleased glint in her eye you could tell she greatly enjoyed this deadly game of cat and mouse. Each blink of the flashlight took longer and longer. There wasn't much juice left. In one sudden motion, I pulled the door open, slipped through, and slammed it shut. The torch revealed twelve concrete steps, in a cramped space at least ten degrees colder than the rest of the building. A huge generator dominated the central space. Behind me, the door splintered from its frame. My attacker slithered straight into the column of light, contorting. This is so fun. After arriving on the stone floor, I set the flashlight on the bottom step in such a way its beam splashed across the stairs. Then, with one I trained on a frozen sienna, I fumbled across the generator, doing my best to remember the instructions while the sputtering bulb produced a strobe effect. Fuel valve on, pull the choke control, flick the control switch. Sienna reached the halfway point, advancing like a slideshow each time the torch faltered. The recoil rope lay on the far side of the device, but before I could reach it, the batteries went to that big power station in the sky, plunging the basement into a sea of darkness. Immediately I rounded the generator and tugged the cord but the engine refused the kiss of life. Oh shit. Before I could mount another attempt, a tentacle coiled around my left foot, so tight the bones nearly crunched. Another trapped my left hand, flexing and writhing, and then both hoisted me, effortlessly, up into the air. As I collided with the ceiling once, twice, plaster cascaded down. My stomach somersaulted like it would on a roller coaster. Tentacles whipped me back and forth before maneuvering me above an expanding, hungry mouth. A tongue slipped out of that cavern, brown and glistening and obscene, tapered into a sharp point. Chow time. I had no light and no hope. I closed my eyes, ready for the end. What do you know, Miss Wilson was right I was surprised by what Sienna threw at me. Just then, her parting advice echoed through some quiet recess of my brain children need discipline. Surely, she didn't mean. In my strictest teacher voice, I said, enough, so loud it overpowered the shrieks. The beast froze. Put me down. Now. I heard myself say. For a moment. Nothing happened. I'm warning you Sienna. Put me down or we won't play any more games for the rest of the night. Gradually, the tremendous pressure built up in my foot and arm eased. The creature's eyes stared at the floor, a misbehaving puppy scolded by its master. Then, gently, it set me down. Standing before it, my back straight, I said, now don't move while I fix this generator. Understood? I took the inaction as a yes. I rounded the generator, grabbed the cord with both hands, and put all my strength into one, sharp tug. The engine roared back to life, the taste of gasoline flooding the claustrophobic space, and then a naked bulb above her heads flicked on. As I collapsed onto the floor, my breaths coming in shallow gulps, a urine stain spread along my trouser leg. Five seconds later, a grinning sienna leaned into my window of vision, poked me in the forehead, and said, I win. Can we play again? When Ms. Wilson returned, her granddaughter was under a dining table. Chairs had been tied around the outside, held together by rope. What's all this mess? Hi Grandma, we're playing animals at the zoo. I'm a lion, Roar. Hunched behind a dresser on its side, I clutched both a mop and a large kitchen knife. Ms. Wilson gave me a disapproving stare before untying the closest chair. Did you have a good time? She asked Sienna, who crawled out from her enclosure. Yup. It was so fun, we played hide and seek and charades and jeng and. Alright dear, why don't you go upstairs and get ready for bed. I'll be along shortly to read you a story. Okay Sienna ran over and threw her arms around my waist. Can Mark come back and play again sometime? She asked Ms. Wilson. Shivers raced along my spine at this suggestion. We'll see. She waved goodbye and then skipped into the next room. So Mr. Jacobs, I presume you had an eventful evening? I said nothing. She pulled a checkbook out of her purse. It would seem Sienna rather enjoyed your company. Again, zilch. Perhaps you would consider babysitting again next Saturday? I have some business too. I shook my head, furiously. She pulled out a fountain pen, scribbled onto a check, and handed over the slip. Give the matter some thought. Perhaps you'll reconsider. It took me almost a minute to digest the number she'd written down. I held the bill with a sense of awe, my jaw hanging open. 
I looked up at my employer, who gave a sly smirk. Shall we say, five o'clock? 